in preparation of today, I have not not put together the slide deck. So I'm going to be using our cohort one's version of this slide deck. Um, the reading the chapter and, and preparing, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to get through the full media, uh, all of the content surrounding this application. Given the slide deck, we should be able to, but um, there's details that I'm trying to expand on while we converse over these sub or this subject. And it may spawn to a, a longer time. We'll see. Okay, I am looking forward to it. I was reading this chapter and it was quite interesting. I never thought of Sava as how uh, the author uh, made me think of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Even this slight thing as just uh, if the 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 identifiers are not similar, the app couldn't work. I, I I once had an issue of that and I couldn't figure out what the error was. Oh. So mm -hmm. right now I'm like, okay, oh, all right. Now I need to be careful with such. Well, the unique IDs, the 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 unique ID labels of your UI and server, those are usually the the catch point. Uh, and there's an example of that in this text towards the bottom, uh, towards the end, where <clears throat> you'll create a unique ID, but it doesn't reference anything on either the UI or any other service. And so, yeah, that just doesn't render. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. It's it's there. It's present, but it doesn't it doesn't have any uh, relation to the to the exchange. So. Okay. Um, one of the while we before we start, I'm gonna do this real quick. Um, show you what I'm referring to. So in the application, and this is actually in chapter 14 is when we'll touch on this. But I wanna I wanna at least give it some presence uh, in this context. Um, if you ever run a shiny app, and it doesn't matter the complexity, how big, small, etc. Um, this is by default just the uh, old faithful geyser Yellowstone Park uh, application, but by moving the slider back and forth, obviously you change your bin rate of the histogram. Okay, so it, it, it changes the uh, format in which it is displayed. Okay, now that's all fine and good, right? That's we've got subject related to what that slider does, how it reacts to the server, the reactive call of, of updating the histogram, et cetera. What's more important in this service, and this is where I'm gonna expand in our topic, on a Mac, it's command F3 or uh, uh, control F3, and Mac, it's command F3. But if you open up your React log for this exchange, okay, this is where you start to get your actual uh, uh, format these objects, these images that they have in this chapter three. And it's it's um, in the authoring of the document, Mr. Wickham is attempting to provide the user with the context of what that linkage looks like, right? These the, the, the little object of, of this kind of flagged sort of, of appearance when they relate to each other. What you're doing is setting up this React log. And so as you play this log, this is your interaction with the service. So the statefulness of that object as it is being populated by the server's data, if it changes, if it updates, it's going to reset. So going back to our old faithful, and again, I'm gonna go over this. So I'm just with you and I together, just covering exactly what's going on here. We have an object called the slider, okay? And this is giving us the number of bins. And by changing that slider, we're sending a command to the server, hey, update the calculation of this object, this output, this, this histogram that we have. By changing that value, telling the server, send us new data, and then it, it populating that information to this object, this histogram on our UI, that handshake between the two going back to the react log that's what's going on here so the statefulness that's the that's the concept that we want to convey is that we have created this unique id this placeholder this location on our ui that we want to populate with information or that we can react or or uh, excuse me uh, interact with 
by changing that value and updating it. There's a statement in the paragraph, sorry, in the chapter where it's uh, referencing uh, modifying that object on the server's side without having any direct UI input and you'll get an error. Well, that's true because it doesn't know what you're doing. It doesn't comprehend how to interact with that memory location on the server without it being the unique ID input from the UI. I'm probably not making sense, but the fact that it's there, the fact that we've allocated resources to that object and that we're trying to manipulate it from a server's perspective, the server has no idea what we're trying to achieve. Um, it's, it's almost like coming from left field. It doesn't understand how to interact with that. So either way, I'll try to cover that in its context within this particular chapter. So I'll stop sharing and we'll get ready for everyone else to join. Nice, I'm excited. I look forward to the chapter. There is one statement that I have really been trying to understand from the book. Um, the statement uh, that is the imperative and declarative programming. So then we have no bit laziness, that particular section. So you remember that analogy that I, I, I came up through? Yes, the imperative being make me a sandwich and the declarative code, and then being that ensure there's a sandwich in the refrigerator whenever I look inside the woods. I, I really look forward to you explaining. You are mute, sorry. Ren, you are muted, we cannot hear you. There we go, sorry about that. The, the idea or the vocabulary, the term, the definition of what a reactive means in context to our studio or to the Shiny application is only specific to Shiny. Um, the term of reactivity is actually a, a, a larger perspective within web development of what that implies. If you interact with anything in the web or even on your phone, some of the apps that you have on your phone, when you open that app and it, it uh, instantiates that service, it, it creates that service, it's, it's now able to interact with it. Well, it's like a placeholder, a template, and that's what the context of the imperative versus declarative uh, service means. You are creating that interactive point, but it doesn't know what to do yet. It doesn't have that, that user input yet. We need to change something about that state of what it's in so that it reacts or it, it sends commands back to the server. It, it requests information from the server. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm being careful with the term react and the, the same concept is with the word laziness. Um, laziness is not lazy as in I'm not moving. I'm a couch potato. I'm not doing anything. Lazy is I'm being extremely efficient with my, my application. I'm not going to do anything unless I'm told to do something. And so in that term of laziness, the way I convey it to users is I'm not going to move until you tell me to move because I'm not being lazy. I'm just being efficient with my energy. I'm not going to do anything unless I'm instructed or told to do something. And again, that has a similar context to the imperative and declarative uh, programming concept. So. Nice. Um, oh. Hi, we really hi, uh, Brendan. Yeah, uh, Yes, Federico is not Federico. Yes, I'm, I'm saying Federico is meant to she had say that she will join. She had even um, signed up for, uh, I think, I can't remember the particular number of the chapter, where I can send an, a message. Um, I hope she joins in the next two minutes. But if not, Ryan needs at, uh, I think, one or five, we can start. Sounds good. All right. Do you want uh, Do you want me to wait just one more minute, two more minutes, for anybody else to join? Yes. Sorry, I thought I'd just take the chance to mention now that I don't think I can present next week, so I apologize for that. Um, 
I realized I'm getting my wisdom teeth removed the day before. So I probably won't even have my camera on. I'll be too self-conscious. as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it, obviously, this is the first time of, of any sort of wisdom teeth removal. Um, so I got one half removed a few years you, okay. ago. Um, and then okay. And then I get the other half now that I have... Yeah, it's almost like walking in, knowing that it's going to hurt um, uh, uh, in preparation, knowing what the recovery uh, piece is going to be. Yeah, I, I've got some horror stories with my wisdom teeth. Uh, during my removal, it was in the military. And so they did all four at the same time, but it was only with Novocaine, you didn't get knocked out completely. And I remember going through the process of just the vibration in your jaw, the cracking and cra uh, the the breaking of, of removing the wisdom teeth. It was not a good experience. I would not uh, wish it upon anybody. So, are you getting are you getting completely knocked out? And don't feel obligated to tell me that's a medical thing. And I don't want to uh, compromise your your uh, healthcare. But um, just curious on on the procedure. What the what the uh, uh, it's it's a dental surgery. It's not just a dentist. Uh, I can't remember what that name of the person is, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's odd because my dentist did do it last time and I didn't get knocked out. It almost felt like a regular procedure. Of course, they it really numbed everything. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'd say it was smooth for the most part, but Good. it does suck that for the next week or so, um, you know, your schedule has to change the things you eat. Every it day. does. Well, you don't, you, don't, uh, you don't really realize how much of an effect having your wisdom teeth re is removed to your daily routine. Um, you're, you're, you're definitely knocked down a couple of levels, that's for sure. Everything moves a little bit slower. Recovery is a little bit longer. Yeah, definitely. Uh, ben, that's okay. I, I wish you good luck with that. And I'm really sorry about the pain. Uh, from Ryan's description, it seemed to scare me. Yeah. <laughs> and so also next week, I may not be available as well. I have a family function that I may have to attend to. Yes, I... Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if we'll not be able to finish up chapter three, we can proceed with that discussion to, for next week, but then I'll have to catch up on recording myself from next week discussion because I'll not be able to join as well. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, I'm gonna go ahead and get started if that's okay. And we'll, uh, we'll see if anybody else joins us. Uh, so this week, team, we're going to be covering chapter three, uh, which is basic reactivity. Uh, I was mentioning to Lucy as we were joining, I did not create the slide deck. So this is going to be from our cohort one version of this slide deck, and I didn't catch the author of it. So um, I know Russ and Frederica and uh, Colin were all part of that uh, cohort one. So um, the media that I'm going to be presenting. If I stumble through it, it's only because I didn't, I didn't author it myself. I did review it uh, in preparation for today, but um, let's share our screen and let me know if everybody can see what I've got. All right. So I'm hoping that what you're witnessing is chapter two, basic reactivity, which is a numbering problem um, that has to do with our very beginning preface of this uh, preface of this chapter or this book. Uh, the numbers aren't quite right. So this is actually chapter three. Uh, the context of it is chapter three. But um, it, when we render, it ends up not capturing that sequence properly. So the learning objectives of chapter three, basic reactivity, is going to be exp uh, to explain in detail the input and output arguments. Now, last week, I spent quite a bit of time discussing inputs and outputs. Sorry, Ren. Yep, go um, ahead. I don't think if we, can, we see a screen. You can't see it. Was... All right. Let's... Uh, yeah. Let me try that again. All right, let's do this again. And this should be desktop two. Oh, you know what? Maybe that's why I messed up. I was on a different. Uh, I was on a different screen, wasn't I? All right, let's try this. Okay, now let's see if you can witness it. We're good now. We can see a screen. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry about that. All right, forgive me. Um, so again, the numbering sequence chapter. This is actually chapter three. So I apologize for the numbering. Um, this is a factor of the the. Uh, Paragraph 0 0.1 is what creates this numbering problem. But anyway, not to be important. Uh, chapter three, basic reactivity, the learning objectives for this 
particular chapter is to explain in more detail how the inputs and the output arguments work. Now, the idea behind input and output, I spent m much time last week uh, as a placeholder of data exchange between server and UI. Uh, we can differentiate between imperative versus declarative programming and how that affects our reactive call and the relationship between UI and server. Describe the basics of reactivity. Both inputs are directly connected to outputs. Uh, Lucy and I were discussing a potential uh, error in our naming convention of unique IDs. So you can have a unique ID in your UI and a unique ID in your server. And if they don't match together, they're not going to connect. And so you'll have some buggy code. It just won't work as expected. And then finally, the fourth bullet is apply reactive expressions to eliminate duplicate work. Now, this last statement, this is actually very important, but I don't know if it's going to mean anything today or, or at this learning stage. What you will find in majority of our reading of both Mastering Shiny and also in engineering production grade Shiny apps is this context or concept of functional programming you write your code in a functional manner so that it's just a placeholder out in the ether and it doesn't actually work until you uh, send data to it and get data back. It's a very much concept of object-oriented programming, but they use terminology that is more specific to our studio and more specific to Shiny. So the, the idea of this reactive expression to eliminate duplicate work, if you find yourself copying and pasting multiple times over, it's a good idea to probably create a function for that instead, because it's a more efficient manner of, of using your computer and networking and server exchange, et cetera. Okay, let's keep going. Now, this first right out of the bat, and I, I, I stumbled over this myself, but what we're trying to do is just a recap of the previous chapter two, an idea of how our shiny scripting language is compiled into this HTML output, this UI browser that uh, users interact with and the back code or the back end code of our server. So we have this R scripting box, we'll call it an object, and then this sequ sequential language that is sent back and forth between the two. Now we can, re uh, we can repeat this or we can change, modify this thought process into reactive programming versus a graph of dependencies. So the concept of chapter three, and it's not directly stated, nowhere in the chapter does it uh, comment on, but we will eventually get to chapter 14, where it's a repeat of this same chapter over again, but we're going to use what they call the React log. And it's a graphical representation of how the UI and the server, this reactive handshake, these two part uh, relationship works. So important learning so far, uh, main app components. So we have our front end. I spoke about this last week. The front end is your UI object. It's the browser. It's, it's, it's what you want the user to uh, compile the document object model, model that is compiled on the user's browser. Uh, as an example, today, uh, we are all connecting over Zoom. So you can think of your Zoom UI as being the user interface, the connection, and then the Zoom server where this is being recorded, stored, and, and is going to be processed as that server end, okay? So it contains all the HTML uh, presented to every user uh, of your app. And it is simple because every user gets the same HTML output. This is important. So whatever you want to convey to your staff, to your users, to your team, right? Anybody that's connecting to your, your Shiny app, they're going to get that same user experience. Well, that's dependent on if it's on a desktop computer, right? I have a larger screen. And so my objects are placed in a little bit of a different manner. If I'm using it on a tablet or a, a cell phone where I've got a smaller screen, this is, is a dynamic HTML. So it's going to render in a format that changes slightly. Okay. But the point being is that the information sent to that user is going to be the same regardless. You also have your back end, which is the server object. So front end versus back end, uh, UI versus server, however relationship you want to create in your mind and how this works. The back end is more complicated because every user needs to get independent versions of the app. 
when a user A modifies an input field, user B shouldn't see the outputs of that change. So what this is called is threading in, in the uh, web server language. Multi-threading implies that the uh, linkage, this communications path that is between the server and the UI can be unique. So, okay, let me re repeat myself to make sure that we're straight. All of the UIs will be the same. All of the information that the, the user uh, perceives is going to be the same. What is unique is the server's relationship of that thread that is sending the information to that user. So user A of our service is not going to get the same information that user B is going to in, uh, interpret. We can have five people, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000, 10,000 people connected to this web server. And because of that multi-threading concept, the information sent to that unique user's uh, UI is only for that person. Right. And it creates a new environment for each run, uh, giving each session to have a unique state. And again, I'm using the term threading because that will be uh, an important element if you do more research into uh, web technology, web service technology. Um, this term of threading is, is what we're trying to create here with this unique state. Okay. So again, uh, we're showing that uh, the user's UI, uh, the shiny UI, the the app version or UI version of this Shiny app uh, is going to be sent to all three different users. The server is going to populate different information dependent on what the server's ask or what the UI is asking, or what the user is asking. Okay. And if this is confusing, if there's any topic terminology that I'm misconveying, please stop me. I'll be more than happy to expand a little bit more and maybe give a different context of how I can relate to the subject. In a deeper dive of the server's function, um, we have a line of text in all of our Shiny apps. Now, the importance of this is creating an object server. We are passing as a function, the input, the output, and the session of that service. This creates or instantiates that unique experience from the servers to the UI handshake. Again, going back to the thought process of 10,000 people connecting to one Shiny application, the call of function input output service uh, or session is that particular information or that particular linkage between that user A, B, C, D, E, F, G versus what the server's sending to that person. Uh, inputs are list-like objects used for receiving input sent from the browser. Uh, they are often read-only, and that's why we will get an error Later in this chapter, we'll talk about a section where uh, if you try to manipulate an object on the server's end, it will error out on you and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, this is an important context of web technology is this concept of read only. It prevents people from pwning web servers. Uh, pwning is, is stealing resources from that web server. You don't want to create a zombie and starting to spam other people. Um, so in most web services, the server's side um, uses symbolic links or uh, a method of read and execute only. You have no write ability. Um, no X, uh, you, you can't create an X equals 12 in the server, otherwise you'll get an error. And it must be read in a reactive context, meaning that we have some level of unique ID call to that particular object and then the response back populating it. Um, on the output side, again, it's the same concept. It's a list object uh, used for sending output. It will always, always, without a question, always use with a render function. You have to have some type of method to compile the information sent from the server. So within this render function, it's uh, uh, passing that information based on the instructions that we give. It will create or, or compile that information into your user's output, uh, sets the reactive context and renders the HTML output. So we have a code snippet below. Uh, let's kind of convey exactly what's going on here. We are creating an object called the UI, and this is going to be a fluid page. Later in our book, we will see that we can change this fluid page to other context. My reference to the term fluid page is that dynamic web browser experience. 
um, if I can do this real quick uh, without messing anything up. Let's try to make this smaller. Okay, so what I'm doing is actually that kind of dynamic context. I'm changing the browser itself, but you can see that the text that I'm interacting with or that it's being presented modifies based on the space that it's able to populate. That's a dynamic uh, environment. So by doing this, this fluid page, it allows us to move things around and, and span or uh, span is not the right word, uh, change the, the format or the space in which we're populating information. Um, we're creating a, a object called text input. This is an input object. Uh, we're giving it a unique ID called name, and then we're adding some uh, material to it. It says, what's your name? We were going to also create an output object and with a unique ID called greeting. In the server's side, okay, so this is the browser's end. This is the user's side of, of what everyone's going to see. On the server's end, as we create that session input, sorry, input output session, as we create that unique ID, the linkage between these two have to be the same. So we have an object called name and we sorry, unique ID called name and a unique ID called greeting. When we interact with it or create this reactive call, we have this render text. We have to have some form of a rendering function for the information to pass and or generate on the browser's end. So we're creating this, uh, or, or sorry, we're passing a string called hello with a space. And then we're inputting to that output object, the uh, input name, the variable uh, unique ID called name, whatever we tell it to be. Um, if we were to render this, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a, it's a box and you'll enter data into the box and then it'll respond back with hello, whatever you put in that box. Um, that concatenation between what the user is entering into that cell box and then what is pasted at the bottom with that output uh, content. I wanna be careful and team, please don't hesitate to stop me if I'm using the words input and output uh, incorrectly to the relationship of what you're building in your mind. Um, these are both input and outputs, but they're just placeholders, they're objects on that browser, okay? As I enter text and pass it to the server and then have it return back with this input name, right? This variable object called name, and then having it uh, paint to the screen or, or, or compile to the screen. Uh, that's how you get that uh, output end. Okay. I'm confusing myself and I wanna make sure that I'm, make, I'm being clear. These are both uh, UI objects, but they're labeled as input and output. And that's why it, it could be a little bit confusing when I'm building this relationship of server and, and UI relationship. Okay, let's keep going. Okay. Reactive programming per Mr. Wickham. Reactive programming is an elegant and powerful programming paradigm, but it can be disorienting at first because it is very it's a very different paradigm to writing a script. Uh, the relationship we're building here, scripts are often from the top down. They're very linear. You start from the, uh, from the beginning and you just go from line for line for line until you reach the very end. In a more object-oriented programming mindset is you have like a main function, right? This is where all of our activity is going to take place. And then we have all of these supporting functions below it where I'm passing variables in and out of these functions, making changes, modifications, et cetera and then putting them back out to the main, uh, returning that object back after its manipulation. This concept or idea behind reactive programming is similar to object-oriented programming, but it's not implying the same context. It's not implying the same relationship. So the mental model we want to build is we tell versus inform. We are providing Shiny with recipes, not giving it commands. And the term recipe is, is a relationship to the tinyverse. Um, if you haven't uh, entered into that arena of tidy modeling and tidyverse language, the word recipe is just a, uh, uh, you're, 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 you're 
you're trying to make chocolate chip cookies, but you need all the ingredients to create the chocolate chip, chocolate chip cookies. Um, these are recipes, not commands. Um, another way to think of that is we're creating these functions, not just scripting exactly what we want to do. Okay. So this brings us into the topic of imperative versus declarative programming. The idea between the differences of these two, imperative is issuing specific commands and it's carried out immediately. So you've got this direct static uh, or, or direct link with whatever you're doing. I send it information and immediately it responds with what uh, I tell it to do. In a more declarative form, we are creating an object and then letting the computer do its job because it's a lot more efficient than a human being. We're not telling it to do something. We're giving it the instructions on what is intended to happen happen when I pass that variable in. So we're expressing at a higher level the goals and or describe important constraints and rely on someone else to decide how or when to translate that into an action. The examples they give is this concept of, of refrigerator. Okay, So you don't want to just tell somebody, go make me a sandwich. Instead, you want to inform them of the location of all of the ingredients to make the sandwich and also put a place in the refrigerator to put the sandwich after it's completed. So instead of just saying, go make me a sandwich, you're gonna say, uh, ensure, ensure there's a sandwich in the refrigerator when I, when I go and look inside it. So if I open that door, magically there is a sandwich already built and compiled for me to consume, all right? Um, imperative versus declarative. In one context, you are saying, give me a chocolate chip cookie. And the other one, you're giving the ingredients and the instructions on how to make the chocolate chip cookie so that when you come home at the evening, there is a plate of chocolate chip cookies already built for you, okay? In essence, you describe your overall goals and the software figures, uh, the software figures out how to achieve them without further intervention. All right, let me, uh, let me pause and kind of give a different perspective on that last statement. When we are programming, when we are authoring, when we are developing our Shiny app, we don't worry about the underlying intricacies of how the web development programming works, right? This, this server language and the networking commands and the threading and all the other weird terms that I'm throwing out here. We don't think about that because that's just implied. It just works. Um, another way that you could think of this, and it's not anywhere related to Shiny in general. Um, let's just think about GPS. Okay, so, so we have all these satellites that are out in space and they're giving us GIS locations on the globe based on a particular you know, grid, this orthogonal type system of latitude and longitude. We don't think about how the satellites work. We don't think about how the mathematics work to give us our GPS location. It just works. That's the concept uh, concepts here in this last sentence. We don't want to think about all of the underlying intricacies of how this works. We just apply a higher order language and then everything else just falls along with it. Does anybody have any thoughts in that regard? It's an important sentence and I, I want to give it the, uh, I want to give it the importance, or sorry, I want to give it the credence of, that it's, it's stating here, the credit. All right move on. All right, the term laziness. This is one of my favorite, favorite examples. I don't approve of the word lazy. I don't, I don't like the term lazy. I don't believe that it provides the right um, relationship. Lazy to me means that you're, you're not doing any work, right? You're, you're kind of lackadaisical. You don't want to have any motivation. You're just kind of there, right? This blob, you're not really doing anything. Um, I don't know, you want to, you want to build your house, but you don't have the motivation to actually start cutting wood and, and, and framing your, your uh, rooms. Uh, so therefore the house is never going to get built. The term lazy in my vocabulary is, is not correct. What I, what I like to change it is being more efficient. I have the energy and I have the motivation to go build the house, but I haven't been given the instructions to how to build it. Um, so I'm there, I'm, I don't know, uh, ready, to, ready to work, but 
I'm not doing anything yet because I haven't been told to do anything. The concept of this laziness is more of, I would like to change the vocabulary to say it's more efficient. You are waiting to be exercised, but you have not been told to exercise yet. Laziness in web development or in networking is very important. It's this state of I'm ready to do work, but I'm not being told to do it yet. So I'm not going to incur the cost of doing that work. Um, I'm not going to burn electrons and create heat, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, you don't burn electrons. It's just a translation of, of energy from one source to another, but forms. The idea is that it's there, it's ready to be used, but it's not being uh, exercised yet. Um, my engine is running, my car is in drive, but I haven't hit the accelerator pedal yet to start uh, getting kinetic energy uh, starting to move. So in that case, I could say that my engine is very lazy at the moment, and it's not until I hit that accelerator pedal that I start moving. This term, extremely lazy, means that Chinese aim is to only do the work that is needed, and it will only update its outputs that you can currently see. Now, you may populate a whole bunch of these unique IDs, right? these inputs and output objects, but we're not going to exercise any of them until the state in which it is required to change. Okay, so I'm going to pause just for a second and uh, uh, go to a different subject and I'm going to come back. What I'm going to show you, and if you just create a Shiny app in your RStudio session, um, literally just go in and say, I need a new Shiny app and then give it a name, it's going to be the, the Old Faithful Geyser. This is just our built-in subject. So I'm not doing anything special here. This is just our... our uh, initial shiny programming concept. What we have is this slider input, and then we have the histogram or this output. And what you do with your slider is change the bin uh, context of how the graph is conveyed. So right now I've got bins of 14. Uh, if I increase that slider, you can see that my graph is changing. If I increase to 46, 47, you can see the graph is changing. This is kind of cool, right? I'm, I'm changing my slider. I'm, I'm having the ability, let me rephrase this. I'm having the ability of creating a slider object and then moving it on my screen, okay? In the relationship of output, I have this object called my graph, my graphical object, my, my grob, if you wanna use that term. And the painting or the creation of that object, the information that the server sends back is modifying that object. In your Windows-based computer, it's going to be Control F3, Function 3. If it, you're on a Mac, it would be Command F3. What I'm going to do is Command F3, and it opens up a new service called the React Log. Now, this will be Chapter 14, so I'm, I'm, I'm jumping light years ahead of your, your current learning at the moment, but I want you to, to realize the relationship of what's going on in this statefulness or laziness concept. If we hit play, and this, these are all of our various objects on the side. This is the reactive call and then the output of what it's doing. So we can see that we have this service called uh, uh, distribution plot. And that doesn't get updated until I change the slider, which is over here on our input bins. Okay. So hitting play, you can see that it's resetting each one of these points. Okay, now this is mind blowing and this is why I wanted to show you this now in preparation of future chapters. The idea of this laziness, this statefulness, this I'm not going to do work until told to do so. The idea of reactive call is that I'm creating the object and I'm waiting for input. I'm not going to modify until I change that input. Once changed, now I'm going to have this cascading relationship effect on the output or the regeneration of that graph. Okay. And this is a, a stepped sequence of how all of those activities are achieved in the underwebbing of the Shiny relationship, the Shiny app relationship. Okay, let's go back. Anybody have any questions about that? I don't want to scare you. That's not something I want you to get wrapped around the axle at the moment. It's just in preparation of future learning. Uh, we, will, we will expand on this idea of how we create unique IDs of different object types, sliders, text inputs, et cetera, uh, graphical objects.
and then link them together so that when I send it from the UI and react, oh, sorry, uh, modify the state on the server's end and then it populates back with information. Okay. Now, this gets us into the subject that Lucy and I were conversing over as we started our conversation. If you notice the question of the past cohort that wrote or put this script together says, will this app work? Mm, well, I can just be preemptive and say that it's not going to, or that yes, it will work if, if, the, if the arguments that I'm satisfying are that the browser populates with information, yes, it'll work. Is it going to is it going to operate in the manner in which I'm expecting it to operate? And the answer is no, it is not. Because we made a, a grave error in our uh, language, our, our uh, keyboard actuating, right? We made a mistake in what we were, we were referring to. And that reactive graph would definitely show you why this is broken. My point is we have this UI object, again, it's a fluid page. We have a text input, text output, and another second text output. The ID is unique ID's name, greeting, and then nice day. I want you to take note of the spelling of nice day. When I render the server and I concatenate or populate when I, when I ask the reactive programming to render this text, it's string concatenate, hello, and then input name. The second line of text says output, and it says nick day, right? That's why, although the nature of this script will run, it will populate your browser, it won't give you an error, it is not going to populate this last line of text. And the reason being is because we don't have a unique ID called Nick Day. We don't have anything up here in our UI that populates this variable that we're, we're calling on the server called Nick Day. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that it's misspelled. If we were to change that back to nice day, now we're interacting with this object recre recreated on our browser, this output object on our browser called nice day. And then the function would work or the app would work. Does that make sense? Um, Lucy made a statement before we started and we were conversing over the, the relationship of this UI and server uh, application. Um, you have to be specific with the spelling or the uh, uh, linkage, the exact name of what we're talking about here. Um, because I'm calling it nice day up here, I have to make sure that I'm calling it nice day down here as well. And using that reactive log, you would realize that there's a object on my server's side called Nick day that never has any linkage to it. There's nothing that is relating to it. It's just kind of off there in the ether. So therefore it would never work. It says caution, if you're working on a shiny app and you just can't figure out why the code never gets to run, double check that your UI and server functions are using the same identifiers, these unique IDs. Okay. Any questions, any comments, thoughts? Okay, all right, moving on. All right, the reactive graph. So understanding the order of execution and the code is only run when it is required. It's lazy, it's efficient. It's not doing anything unless it's ex explicitly asked to do something. So this reactive graph thought process is we have inputs, we have the reaction itself, the react reactive, and then the output. Well, so this is our unique ID of name the reactive would be render text and the output would be the identifier that we're asking on the server side to populate or to change, modify, et cetera. Describes how inputs and outputs are connected is a diagram identifying the reactive dependencies and it describes this relationship where output has a reactive dependency on the input. My point is whenever you see the word render text or render output, render anything, that is usually a function of reactivity. And you need that service, you need the ability to create that within the paradigm of shiny apps within this web technology that we're using for our studio. Okay. So we have name and greeting. 
there's no, uh, I guess, greeting in this case would be both the reactive and the output because the box style of how it's created this uh, little flagged area. Um, for future purposes, and at the very end of this slide deck, I'm not sure exactly where they're going with the thought, but um, there's two things that happen uh, and the, it depends on the language that you're writing in. Within our studio, within the IDE of our studio, within the language of R, there's a package called Diagram R. Diagram R provides you the ability to create these graphical objects, these uh, like placeholders, they're usually vector graphics. In other web development languages, it's actually called Mermaid JS. Uh, Mermaid is the, is the uh, library that provides us the ability of generating or compiling these objects. Um, I'll show you an example at the very end of the slide deck. Again, I was a little put off by why they put that in there, but um, I think it may be in a relation to say, hey, if you're not going to use diagram R, here's another way that you can achieve that same graphical object. A reactive graph is a powerful tool for understanding how your app works. It, uh, you can make it by hand. So just take out a piece of sketch paper and write out exactly how you want this server and UI relationship to, to operate. You can use the diagram R package and it makes it manually yourself. So this is your ability to populate or create these cells. Um, or you can use what they call the React log and that package uh, does it automatically. Uh, and we'll talk about that in chapter 14 at a later point. Okay. Um, you're all very quiet and not asking any questions. So that either tells me two things. Um, it's boring as sin and I'm not uh, uh, conveying it properly or um, I'm covering it to the degree that you're requesting and uh, everyone is happy with, with how the presentation is going. Do you have any thoughts or any comments? No, I think the presentation is okay. Good, okay, excellent. Now, reactive expressions as a placeholder, uh, a tool that reduces the duplication in your reactive code by introducing additional nodes into the reactive graph. And then it says, how do you use a reactive? Well, this isn't just an example and it's only the server's end is we're creating the server object, input, output, and session. Within that call, we have a string. This is going to be a reactive, hello, input name. And then the output calling on the unique ID greeting is render text and then paste that string. The way this reactive works, you can see that it's actually two different points. We have an object name and with string and with greeting. In other words, the reactive makes the app cleaner and more efficient by removing redundant code uh, and recomputation. It's lazy, it's efficient. It also simplifies the reactive graph. Reactive expressions have a flavor of both inputs and outputs. Like inputs, you can use the results of a reactive expression in its output form. Like outputs, reactive expressions depend on inputs and automatically know when they need updating. Okay, so going back to the early conversation or my statement of imperative versus declarative languaging uh, programming. In an imperative form, I would already have this placeholder and I would just tell it, here's my location of where I want you to populate it, go do the work. When I open my browser and I go to my web UI and it, it populates or compiles the document object model compiles, I already have predefined input, sorry, predefined variables that are in those cells in a more declarative form is this reactionary uh, handshake where although the object is there, I haven't, I haven't reset the state of that object. Therefore, I haven't called upon its server population yet. Once I type in some input text or uh, I move my slider back and forth, now I'm modifying the relationship of that reactive call and it repopulates itself. Or it, 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 I don't want to use the word re-render, that's kind of a weird term, but it, 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 it renders a second time, it resets itself and then populates with whatever new information it's provided. All right. Uh, Ren, I have a question. I, yeah, I, I don't think if I'm understood. I, yes. 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still lost trying to understand the two function. For example, here the reactive and render text. So if I got correctly from the discussion we have, it's that for render text is, um, it's a function of reactivity. So if, for example, the input here, it's the name, but the output is what it's rendering like a text. So that is what we see. And then um, and what exactly is reactive this function? No, the it, string, yes, exactly. What is this function exactly doing here? It's just a wrapper. It, it, uh, the reactive function as a, as, a, as a use case is nothing more than uh, a uh, statefulness of an object in waiting for it to update its information. Um, that's not a good comment either. Um, I would say it that the reactive function term that we have here versus the render text form that we have at the bottom in the use of these two functions, they mean the same thing. They're going to have the same activity. They're going to, uh, they're going to generate the same output. So the, the use of the two, um, I'm not saying are, because I don't want to guide you in, the wrong, in uh, the wrong direction. Being able to have a statefulness of an object on the user's browser and waiting for input from the server or output from the server to populate that object. The definition of reactive and rendered text are Im implying the same context. We're just declaring or requesting this be wrapped in a reactive call. Um, let's see if I can say, say it in a different way. If I have an output from my server that's going to populate some information and I put it in a render text, that's just the defined function of how to compile it. If I wrap that same object in a reactive, it's going to do the same thing. It's going, it's, it's going to compile in the same manner. Um, does that answer your question, Lucy? And I'm not, I, I, I may be, I may be confusing you with how I'm explaining these two. Um, in, in a, in a, in a use case, they mean the same thing, but they are two different methods in which we can convey the same activity. I don't know if this is helpful either, but when you just look up right. the reactive function um, in R, it tells you conceptually a reactive expression is an expression whose result will change over time. Um, so that, yeah, it's just how I understand it. So the, the, the idea of this render text is saying I'm inputting some data and I'm expecting it to populate in my, in my second uh, output uh, placeholder. The use of a reactive call does the same thing, the statefulness of that object and, and going back to my React log, sorry. I want to clarify when I use the term statefulness, that's, that's going to be coming out at a, a later point in the chapter. And I apologize for sounding more advanced in terminology, but the idea of this statefulness is, is the concept of laziness or, or efficiency. I'm not going to change in the current form that I'm conveying until I'm expressly told to change. So that when I, when I update and I, I get a new modification of the instructions I'm given, I'm going to reset and then recompile with this new information. So the statefulness is this idea that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be exactly where I'm at until I'm told to move or change. The lines of text, uh, the darker uh, stroke of line versus this more dotted line, uh, dash line form, uh, that's the, in, in the terms that I'm using is called statefulness or the, the green versus gray is, is conveying the same concept of this statefulness. Okay, I uh, think you both, yes, now I understand. Good. It, 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 if it's still a little bit muddy right now in this, in this mindset, wait until we get further down into these more intricate chapters, you're going to learn, uh, you're going, the, the author is going to convey a lot more uh, support in this, in this thought process. Awesome, I look forward to it. Awesome, all right, uh, let's keep going. All right, 
we, uh, <laughs> they're throwing in a couple more vocabulary terms. Um, I'm not, I can't opinionate myself to say if it's good or bad. I don't want to sway you in one direction or the other. I'm just going to put it out there and, and you do with what you need to with this information. So they, they, they call these producers and consumers. Um, in my own thoughts, it's the same concept of input and output, but I'm, again, I don't want to, I don't want to sway your opinion. You are, are just as efficient as I am with learning this as, as anybody. So producers are referred to reactive inputs and expressions and consumers refer to the reactive expressions and outputs. So again, we're just calling it different terms, but it means the same thing. It conveys the same thing. So with this Venn diagram, we are grouping these together. The producer, right, this, this outer object, this producer is gonna have an input and an expression. The consumer, the other end of this relationship and following the lines drawn around it has the expression and the output. So again, I'm not wanting to say that this is good or bad or confusing or not confusing. I'm just thinking in my mind, one more analogy that we can wrap around this thought process. Um, if the terms in use, you wanna use producer and consumer, that's fine too. Right? Uh, review the app, uh, testing the differences between two simulated examples. And that's going to be this next section here. Uh, no, where did that text go? Sorry, team. Let me bump back over here real quick. Uh, where's that at? This is where things get a little bit hairy with our slide deck versus the chapter that we're reading. Sorry, I'm scrolling here. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Uh, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of material in the chapter in reading it uh, versus how the previous cohort and the author created the slide deck. Um, they kind of blazed over this whole section of the graph and how the, the scripting UI relationship, if you would want me to go over this, I, I can do this too. But, um, we're conveying the same graphical object, this producer-consumer relationship. Um, so the motivation is what they're, uh, as, as a subtext, sub support to this thought process, uh, the motivation behind here. Uh, we're evoking the ggplot2 library. Uh, we're creating this frequency plot um, with some functional information, x1 and x2. Um, and then it's output. If, if, if I have simulated data, I can use these functions to compare two variables. So we generate these, these two arbitrary values, uh, fictitious material, and then we plot the output of those two functions. Um, when I wrap this graphical object into more of a shiny context, now it's gonna be a placeholder. So before we were just creating a script for ggplot, creating a couple of, of uh, data points and then plotting their comparison between the two. Wrapping this in more of a shiny context is going to be now this fluid page and then fluid row. Uh, we have columns, 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 and then secondary columns. The server function combines, uh, combines calls from frequency uh, poly and t-test functions after drawing from specific distributions. So if we look, we have output histogram, and I bet you anything, if I go back up to the top, I didn't look at it fast enough, but uh, we probably have an object called hist up here. Uh, let's go find it real quick. There it is, plot output hist. So I'm rendering from the server this output object hist, and then I'm rendering the plot. Okay, before what you've witnessed in the past was render text uh, in this case, we're using render plot. So render plot, my variable x1, r norm, input n1, input mean one, and input sd1. I'm assuming that's standard deviation. Uh, x2 is r norm uh, with input n2, input mean two, and input sd2. Uh, for the purposes of this chapter, what I want to really focus your uh, eyesight on is the naming convention or the unique ID naming convention of these objects. So going back up to our UI, you're going to have these unique ID naming points. Does that make sense to everyone? 
how I'm compile uh, how I'm relating between the UI and the server calls. Okay. And then let's see, we have t test uh, x1 and x2. Uh, make sure I'm doing this correctly. Yeah. Uh, this fluid row and column four, four, and four, what that's doing is creating these points. Uh, the uh, cell inputs uh, or, or, or object inputs. Okay. Uh, the definition of the server in the UI fields in figure 3.6, you can find a live version at this location. Let's just go there anyway, so we can go check out what we're doing. So I can change this number and what, in the purposes of this chapter three, I'm going to try and convey what is going on here. The statefulness of this input object is currently at 1007. When I modify it and change it to 1008, you notice the graphical object modifies too. This concept of producer consumer, this reactive call between inputs and outputs, the uh, statefulness, laziness, uh, uh, efficiency of relation. This is not going to change. Uh, if, if I refresh, will it default back? I bet it does, because I'm just making a new call to the server. Yeah, never mind. That didn't do what I wanted it to do. Um, I was hoping to refresh the browser and keep the state of the relationship between my two points. It didn't. It just repopulated with a 1,000. But that's more towards the refreshing of the browser and recompiling of the browser. So it's going to populate again. Um, but modifying this and changing the graph, I don't know if function F3 will work here. I don't think it will. Uh, is it command F3? Yeah, it's saying, nope, we don't have that option built into it. So my uh, shiny, Hadley shiny apps IO calls back and says, I don't know what you're trying to do. We don't have that set. So um, it's not going to allow us to do what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, I was going to uh, pull out the reactive log of what we're doing here, but the server doesn't have that option set up for us. Any questions or Lucy specifically, am I, am I helping in the helping in the mental model of how these two link together? between each other? I, I, I think yes. I, okay. Yeah, I, I, I may have to go reread, but yeah, I, I, I have some idea. <laughs> well, the, this section, this paragraph 3.4 that we're re, uh, reflecting on this idea of motivation and how to create the script and how the script works, et cetera, this is all uh, I won't call it noise. It's more of a very thorough example of how to convey all of the previous information we received in the chapter um, up to this point. So, and that's right. I'm 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 presuming here. I'm being presumptive that the author of the previous cohort, the author of this slide deck from our last cohort, um, didn't run down this path. They didn't they didn't go down this rabbit hole too far. Um, executive order <clears throat> determines solely, this is where I'm getting a little spotty team. So um, as I'm just reconveying this information, give me the luxury of hopefully trying to analyze exactly what they're trying to state here and then put it in different words for us. Um, we have three minutes remaining. Is it? Okay. Yep. I figured yes. we were getting close to time. All right. Um, I'm at paragraph 2.8 going to paragraph probably 2.10. Um, is it okay with everyone if I try to shoot through this and finish chapter three, or do you want to wait? Otherwise, we're going to be hanging next week with 10 minutes of speech and, and, and 40 minutes of staring at each other. I think you can proceed. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The determined solely by the reactive graph and not in the order of the lines of code output to the server function. I believe in the chapter we were referring to uh, the placement in our server function, uh, the order of linear path from top 
of the lines of text to the bottom of the lines of text wrapped around in that server. It says you can put these anywhere. You can change their order and it's not gonna affect how it is, it is rendered on the screen. Um, it's not good practice. Don't, don't do that. It's okay that you initially during authoring, if that's how your brain is working and, and connecting the dots of where you're going, that's fine. But you want to try and maintain this uh, linear path of logic between the UI and the, and the, and the server. Uh, it's not bad to say that it's flip-flopped all over. It's just hard to read. It's hard to debug uh, because the nature of I'm calling it in this form on my UI and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the servers in, in reverse order, it makes it hard for the relationship to build or, or the debugging, the looking at the code. So the executive order, what we're trying to state here is try to maintain that same path between these two points, the UI and the server side. And it's more important, it's, it's, it's going to relate better in later mature use of Shiny, uh, where we start creating functions and possibly even packaging and all these other nuances that come along with uh, forming these apps. Uh, if you maintain this order of path, it's going to make it simpler for you to debug and, and to uh, uh, relate to what's going on. Okay, uh, controlling timing of evaluation. Um, so we're using this timer function. And this is a really cool exercise. If anybody is curious and wants to follow with it, I think it's in the chapter as well. Um, it creates this timer mechanism. And then we call out the reactive graph. Uh, when, when, when I'm referring to this term of reactive graph, it's this log data. Um, the format in which you are exercising this timing function is starting to create the uh, efficiency, laziness, statefulness of our Shiny app. Uh, this timer function uh, calls at a, a system log system time and will reset the object. And then you'll see this uh, path of modification across that log file uh, as you play it. And each time the value changes over seconds, uh, it will create this cascading effect relationship of the reactivity call between inputs and outputs. Um, keep going back, we're almost done. Uh, I did not run this script or, or I don't have it able to run. So therefore the context of this object, this graphical form, uh, lambda, the value n and then lambda two, and then how they relate to x1 and x2 to give me this history output. Uh, this timer call is resetting x1 and x2. And so every time it, it, it uh, updates, you're gonna see these x1 and x2 reset and then history reset. Um, maybe I should run this maybe next week if that's okay. Um, the same thing happens with this on click. So you can, uh, it gives you a mouse listener or a event reactive uh, where I'm selecting it and then showing what that simulation does. I'm being kind of dumb here. I'm covering this material, but I'm not really showing it in real time. So it, it has no direct uh, connotation. There's no, there's no idea of what this object is doing without watching it in real time. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last point that I wanted to cover um, with the observer itself. Anytime you need to make a call out of the application, uh, whether that be saving a file, sending an API call, updating a database or printing a debugging message, the observers don't affect how this app works. Um, so the object that it's showing here, and it's, it's very hard to see, but there's a, there's a box around these flags, uh, call them flags, uh, greeting, print, input, console, debugging, input, database, write data, input, API. It has no direct effect on your call. Uh, these are ancillary things that happen outside. Uh, it's not technically threading, it's just additional services, ancillary services that have no direct effect on the reactivity of your app. Okay. 
it may be an add-on or plug-in on top of the function that you're doing, but uh, it has no direct effect on the relationship between browser and server. Uh, the important differences are observe event and event reactive. You don't, you don't or can't assign the result of an observe event to a variable. There's no way to, to put it in that object. Uh, and you, you can't refer to it from other reactive consumers. Um, and then, yeah, this last one is just showing you an example of Mermaid. Uh, Lucy, that's my conclusion of chapter three. Um, I don't think I did very good with these last two or three chapters, or sorry, two or three sections. I think it would probably be to our benefit if we covered those next week with more time. Yes, that's okay. Um, so keeping it, thank you very much for the good presentation. Yeah, we have surely learned a lot. Yeah, and um, so since Brenda will not be able to uh, present next week, do you think we meet the other weekend? Because now for next week, it will only be the few minutes and then now, oh, oh. What do we do next? So I I'm suggesting if there is any possibility we shift the meeting for next week to upper week. Because even me also I'll be busy that next week. And we're having conference that is starting from, from Monday up till the weekend. Is it possible yeah. we shift it by one week so that the upper week everybody will be available? Yes, so you mean we, we, we meet again on 21st? Yes, that is next week. Weekend will not meet. Then with the upper week, I think we, we, everybody will be available by then. We can meet. So, Ryan and Brendan, is it okay? So, Brendan will pick uh, the next chapter four, and then uh, Ryan will finish off the sections remaining. Yes, so we'll meet again on 21st. That's fine. Awesome. That works. Susie, do you want to post on our on our Slack channel to indicate that that uh, to the rest of anybody that may join us uh, the the change of not meeting next week? Yes, I, I will do that. After okay. The call. Yeah. All right. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. And thank you for letting me run over as well. I appreciate it. Ah yes, yes, yes. I I think you are the right person to do this chapters compared to me, I wouldn't have gone into uh, the deeper and like, uh, I'm looking for, yeah, I kind of diving into the chapter deeper as you have done. Yeah, I wouldn't have done so, so yeah. There's a, okay. there's a, there's an undertone of shiny and it's, it's funny and I, I'm just briefly reconveying, reconveying this thought. Shiny's language, right? Just the terms that we use in this book aren't conducive to normal web development. And that's really where this bridge starts to kind of shake, uh, scratch your head. If, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm within the context of Shiny and I'm using the language dedicated to our studio, I'm not, I'm fine. I can, I can make this work. If, you, if you're a web developer and you come into the Shiny world, the terminology is a little foreign. And that's really where this, uh, I try to bridge between the two services. If you do happen to jump out and do other web development, um, the relationship of, of how in our studio, we call it one thing in web development, we call it something different. So that, uh, that's a really, really big gap that we need to fill. So. Okay. I will, we will meet on 21st. Bye. Have yourself a good weekend. You too. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.